Okay, great. I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Leslie Hutchings, and I'm the VP of Membership and Strategy here at CEW. And I just want to first say um, that all of us at CEW are hoping that you and your families are staying as safe and as healthy as possible at this time. And we thank you so much for joining us uh, for a webinar on a very timely topic from one of CEW's board members, Wendy Liebman. Wendy is the CEO and Chief Shopper of WSL Strategic Retail, and she is a great partner of CEW's. Today, she will show us how shopper attitudes and behaviors are changing as a result of the pandemic, as we transition from a health crisis to a financial crisis. And she will also share emerging opportunities for the beauty industry to consider. And for everyone who's on our call today, that I just wanted to let everyone know that throughout the presentation, um, please type any questions you have for Wendy in the questions pane, which is in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. And at the end of the presentation, Wendy will respond to as many questions as she can. So that's enough from me. Um, let's go ahead and get started. So Wendy, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Leslie. And hello, all our CW family. It's, uh, as Leslie said, uh, from our family to yours, we hope that you are well, that you are juggling all the things that you have to juggle, which is not so easy today. And uh, I think we're just all fortunate that we have time to be here and sit and talk and think about the future. And that's what I plan to do today. I'm gonna to talk about how can you find this, what we call the next normal, not the new normal, the next normal, I'll explain that later, in this post-COVID beauty world. You know, I think all of us uh, anticipated a correction in the economy towards the end of last year. Why do I say that? Well, the stock market was at extraordinary levels. Unemployment was the lowest it had been in decades. Uh, we saw that uh, Salaries were increasing a little bit, savings were increasing a little bit. So things were pretty good, but it had been going up, up, up for a very long time. And I think many of us thought, well, when will this bubble burst? Well, a correction in the economy we anticipated, but nobody anticipated this one. How can something so beautiful as this be so deadly? But that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the shock of COVID-19 and how the coronavirus has upended our worlds. I'm going to talk about the broader context of what we call shopping life and how that's changed so fast. And then I'm going to talk about the sort of road to the next normal. What does the next normal look like? And why do I not call it the new normal? Well, that's because we don't believe it's going to be the sort of one leap up into a new normal. We believe it's going to be a roller coaster ride of next normal and next normal. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. And then at the end, as Leslie said, I'm going to talk about some, some things I think that might frame up your future. So why are we here? Well, we've been sequestered away, hopefully safely, for at least six weeks, maybe longer for some of you. And it is really now time for us to plan. We really do have to think about how do we take our lives and our businesses and our brands and our retail formats and everything we do, how do we plan for the future? So that's what I'm gonna focus on today. Um, Leslie was kind enough to give me a nice introduction. Thank you, Leslie. But I just wanted to sort of give you a, a, a bit fuller of one, fuller of one, excuse my bad grammar, a fuller one, more complete one, uh, just to give you a context for the way we look at um, and, and look at this work and the way you should consider it. You know, the work we do with our clients around the world is to help them anticipate and innovate their future retail, whether they're brands or retailers, whether they're tech companies or service companies. And we do that through a unique lens. It's through understanding shoppers and what we call their shopping life. How do people live their life, the impacts of the economy and politics and social issues and technology, how does that impact how we live our lives and then how we choose to spend our money on goods and services? So that's the lens. And we do a lot of our work through our How America Shops research in the US and how the world shops around the world, obviously. Um, and I'm gonna share some of this new work with you today. 
This is national, these are national studies we do continuously and have done them for over 25 years. Thank you for not commenting, um, for 25 years. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to share with you some really recent data um, that we have done research first in the middle of March, then in April, and we're going to continue to do that work through June, August, November. So we follow this like, very dynamic situation. The other thing I'm going to do is step back a little bit. This is not our first crisis and share with you some context for some of the things we actually learned in the last crisis of the uh, recession and talk a little bit about how actually, what that learning might actually be for us all uh, and what might have no relevance at all. So I'm going to set that context too. So to begin, the shock of COVID-19, well, no need to say more than that, right? The shock of it all. But just to think about this, last November, three quarters of the population of this country, based on our How America Shops research, said they were living well. And by living well, they were engaged in healthier choices, good health, wellness, well-being, feeling more financially secure. They were feeling pretty good about things. Five months later, we all know this, right? 85% of the population now tell us that they are worrying that they will catch the virus. And that's a big switch in five or six months. And we know this because we are all shoppers. We've lived through this and are living through it. Last November, most of the population, men and women, ages, incomes, ethnicity, were feeling pretty financially secure or optimistic about what was going on. Many fewer were pessimists about their financial security. And then today, those numbers are changing very fast. Now 40% of the population are feeling very pessimistic. And I would suggest to you when we go back into the field with our research, in a few weeks, we will see that number increase. And it is of no surprise, right? Shopping life changed, and it changed very fast with the flick of a switch. It felt like that, right? It felt like the light just went on or off so fast. But what's fascinating about that is in spite of it, or because of the fact that it's not, not just our first crisis or anybody's first crisis in this country, more than half of the population already are saying they're proud about how well they're managing. You know, they give themselves some credit for the fact that in spite of all this change and how fast it came, they are actually feeling quite competent, if not tired and frustrated and challenged, but proud of what they're doing. And it's because this is not anybody's first crisis, maybe Gen Z, maybe the, the youngest of our populations, but think about it, back in September 11, 2001, and then through many other crises, as you can see this roller coaster, through to the financial crisis in 2008-9, and lots of things in between. We have a competent shopper who's actually getting on with their life quite fast. We've seen already how quickly people are beginning to reassess their lives. I mean, in the middle of April, half of the population already told us they were reevaluating what's important to them. Raise your hands, please. Have we all done that? Yes trying to find ways to keep calm with the, 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 the frustration, the challenges, the worries about our health, reviewing finances, all of these things I think we're all doing, but especially younger people. Look at these numbers, anywhere from eight to 15 points higher for Gen Z and millennials on those numbers, younger people really reassessing their lives. We're also seeing the population very focused on staying well, that that is now a priority. And again, not surprising, right? We are in a health crisis. And so we see people already telling us that they are exercising at home more, can't get out right. They're really paying attention and working hard to read and learn more about issues that are emerging. They're trying to take care of their own health and wellness by vitamin supplements, building immunity, trying to be healthier. And in spite of this crisis, one in five, 19%, also tell us they're doing things more for sustainability. They've not given up on that. And all of these numbers, yet again, are higher for younger populations, anywhere from six to 13 points higher for Gen Z and millennials. Really, staying well has become a priority for everyone, but especially younger shoppers. 
you all know this, retail very quickly began to shift to an e-commerce or omni platforms, right? Especially for essentials. More than half the population have already ordered groceries and health products online, whether for delivery or pick up at the store. But what's really interesting about that is that half of those people ordered these categories online for the first time. And so we began to see this ramping up because of necessity to order online. But that wasn't just for the essential of eating and taking care of our health, that was for beauty too. And I'm sure many of you have seen this. 43% of women told us that they had ordered beauty online for either delivery or pickup since COVID-19 struck the population. That's up 13 points since 2019. And again, what's really interesting in all of this is that 28%, so that's about half of the 43%, excuse the math, so the 28% of that 43% actually ordered beauty online for the very first time. 18% from specialty beauty stores like Sephora or Ulta or Blue Mercury or others, right? But what's interesting about that, not just first time users, but also the fact that of that 43%, most of them, eight out of 10, tell us they will continue to order beauty online after the crisis is over. So that switch from health and groceries has also impacted beauty very quickly. And this is where they've ordered from, not just beauty, this is the, everything they've ordered. Websites they've ordered from in this last COVID month from March to April. We've seen, as no surprise to any of you, that Amazon has in fact led the way and raise your hands again, who's ordered from Amazon in the last minute or two or three or four or 10. Walmart up there as well. And what you start to see in this very quickly is the sort of condensing of the online e-commerce space, Amazon and Walmart. Perhaps no surprise, but really clear. And then we see other retailers, Target, Walgreens, Costco, CBS in that mix of people of places people have ordered from in the last in the last month and then we go to see the specialty stores on the right as well as supermarkets we see department stores one in four tell us they've ordered something not just beauty something from the department store website in the last month and i think we all know right we've heard the macy's people talk the nordstrom people talk bloomingdale's if not for online if not for e-commerce then in fact their business would be really, really in, in difficult straits. And there's the specialty beauty number. So the message here is that people are ordering online from lots of places, but there's a lot of first time ordering and that shifted the landscape. The other thing we've seen, which is really interesting, is this sort of the necessity that's come from confinement or for trying to find things either online or in stores that you can shop at, that may be where, that's driven you to look for new brands. So one in four tell us they've tried new brands they've never used before, not just beauty, but anything, either because they couldn't find what they wanted or because they're looking for things with new kind of benefits, health related benefits perhaps, protection kind of benefits. And one in five tell us they're shopping on websites that are new to them as well. So in spite of being engaged and pulled into ourselves and isolated, there's a lot of research and purchasing going on in new territories. But what we do know now, and what we really have to stay focused on as we move from a health crisis into a financial crisis, and sadly to say, potentially back into a health crisis, is that people are already just saying no. That's that feeling confident that I'm, or feeling proud of the way that I'm managing. Well. 51% are telling us they're already cutting back because they're not sure what will happen. Um, a third of people are telling us now that they're avoiding places where they might be tempted to overspend. And 51% are saying to us, before I buy something now, I'm asking myself, is this a smart use of my money? Now, these are questions or these are attributes that we asked back in the recession. And so we have a benchmark measure of what this looks like versus the financial recession. Well, that's what it looked like in 2009. So this is the ceiling we know that we may very well get up to as we move through this financial crisis and move forward. 
here's one of the things you all know, of course, as we move through this, that we are now living in this closed society and it's had a tremendous impact already on what our beauty life looks like. 43% of women who are actively engaged in their beauty tell us they are now spending less time on their beauty routines and I think we all know that. And they're doing it for a couple of reasons. One is because they don't need to. I mean, if I'm sitting in my sweatpants and working at home and trying to juggle the kids' education and cooking and cleaning and everything else that we are amazingly doing, I may not need to. And also some telling us they just don't have the time to with all of that juggling that's also going on. So all of these things are changing the dynamics of the life that we are leading. and yet some are actually thinking about doing a bit more of it. 16% tell us they're actually spending more time on their beauty routine and that's probably because some of us, mm -hmm, me included, says you know even when I'm having a video chat with my team in the morning at the end of the day, you know I do want my lipstick on um, and certainly for those of us who are trying to colour our hair at home again or cut our hair, if you ever tried to do that in the mirror that's a challenge. We really need more help on that, so we're doing more services at home or we're watching more videos or tutorials or something to help us do it. So there is some more going on, it's just different. So how do we think about all of this in the context of this next beauty normal? Well, here's some of the things we need to consider. First of all, we have to think about this. Here's what we know from other crises. When confidence recovers, when unemployment recedes, shoppers will return. But here's the fundamental truth. We know that their buying habits will be different and that's what we have to think about a lot today. What does that mean to us really? When we think about what does shopping life look like as we move through 2020 to 2021, there are two things I will guarantee you. One is that shoppers will come back with a caution and they will come back with a prudence. Caution and a passion for new values. Not just value price but values because this is quickly transforming the way they live their life and we know that from previous crises. And they will also be prudent they will also come back with this passion for savings and that's what we have to be very, very conscious about now. So here's a little bit of insight from the work we did in 2008 because this is still value, valuable, sorry, this is still valuable and is valid as we think about it. One of the things we really know is that frugal shopping will return. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean we're all going to be incredibly conscious about how we spend our money. What we saw in 2008 was people didn't stock up until items were on sale, three quarters of the population. We saw that people waited for a sale rather than buy at full price. We saw that they read the circulars, whether they were digital or physical. We saw that they used more coupons. And we saw this sort of last moment, and remember that data point I said, 51% of people are already asking themselves, is this a smart use of my money? Well, back in 2008, we saw this large number of people get to the checkout, whether it was in a store or it was in a, um, uh, a digital online shopping basket, and they reassessed what they were spending and began to take things out of their basket. So that's something for us to consider. The other thing we saw is that people began to trade down, cutting back in products and services, trading down to less expensive brands and it was across a lot of things, not just beauty, but beauty, skincare, cosmetics, salon services were all things that people began to reassess. Sometimes it was just, you know, instead of going and getting my hair coloured every five weeks or four weeks, we saw people going every, you know, adding one more week on, things like that. Um, moving down from maybe a high-end brand to a next tier brand mixing up high-end and medium-priced or lower-priced brands. All of that became part of how they started to think about being smart shoppers. And we expect that to develop and continue as we move through this financial crisis. 
But here's the thing to think about. As we move through this period of time, there's going to be an underlying um, way of thinking that American shoppers will have for everything in their lives. What we know is when people go through a period of chaos, they try to take control of what they can. And what we see here already, and we'll move on through the next 12 to 18 months, is this important passion to take care of their own health, their own health, their family's health, their community's health, and in fact, the world's health. Because they know if they don't, they can't be assured of what else will happen. And that's how we have to begin to frame our beauty world. Shoppers are already talking to us about immunity and protection, about accessibility, about affordability, about who should they trust, not just for health categories or food categories, but for their beauty too. How can they use beauty in a way that helps protect them, whether it's ingestibles or whether it's what they put on their face, their skin, their hair, their bodies? How can they have access to things that are better for them or in any way easily accessible so they don't have to go out of their way if they're trying to be safe and sound? How can they afford things? You know, part of this is that often products that are considered better for you are also more expensive for you. Well, the fact of the matter is people are not necessarily going to be able to pay more. So the question is, how can we make beauty products that are better for us or have added benefits affordable for everyone. And the other aspect is, who will we trust? Can I, as a shopper, trust your brand? Do you actually care about me and my family? Do you care about the people who work for you and your companies? We have to rethink the way we build loyalty. And it's all grounded in this notion of what I would call whole health. This notion of where we've moved from a lifestyle movement that I talked to you about, 73% of the population said they were living well, to actually a life-saving movement. And we're moving to it with a new urgency, this desire for control in every aspect of our lives, not just what we eat or what we wear, but also what we put on to be beautiful every day. So here's the thing, here's the opportunity the opportunity is now, now is how do we reinforce this connection between beauty and health? That's the opportunity. And the fact of the matter is, it's not a stretch for many of us. You don't have to be just a clean beauty brand or a natural brand or somebody who sells in you know, unique health-oriented um, uh, categories or retailers or formats. This is inherently part of beauty. This is data that we shared from our, one of our How America Shop studies in 2018. Six out of 10 women said looking better makes me feel not just beautiful, makes me feel healthier. So an underlying tenant exists already for us to make this connection. In 2018, many were already engaged in healthy beauty. 43% said they were buying beauty products to look healthier. 42% said they already had bought something either clean or natural or free from beauty in the past year. And those numbers, yes again, here's that younger generation who are much more engaged in this promise and proposition of healthier beauty. This is especially true in skincare where two thirds of the population said they would pay more then for healthier skincare and they wanted to know more about what makes skincare healthier. So as we began to move through this movement and think about where the connection is for beauty and health, it's already there. But we also saw this last piece of data coming out of um, 2019 and early 20, that people were already engaged in thinking about healthier values. And this was a question we asked about whether people were willing to pay more all the time or some of the time for brands and companies that had a a stronger set of values about brands that were sustainable or companies that treated their employees well or were inclusive in their advertising or focused on sustainability. I'm not suggesting that people will necessarily pay more today, but I am suggesting that these values were already ingrained in the community of shoppers. 
So what do we think about here? How do we think about this now? Well, here are five things to move your planning ahead, sort of a framework, if you will, in this new COVID-19 next normal. First of all, you need to feel their pain or feel our pain, right? We're all in this together, as everybody keeps saying. This is about helping people feel responsible and proud of what they're doing. We already saw it, right? We already saw that number, the 52% feel that they're doing something, they're, they're really working hard to protect themselves. This is where empathy really stands out. The second thing that's really important is we need to understand this new context. Now, some of you will say, I'm in the color cosmetics business, how do I fit into this health proposition? But actually, we need to deconstruct everything we do and reassess it. Not only what products do we have and what messaging or what ingredients or what packaging or how we sell it or where we sell it or how we treat our people, we need to pull all the pieces apart and say, are we now relevant in this new world? The third thing is, how do we keep shoppers in our brands? How do we let them trade down or even trade up, but not out? People will trade up in these times if there's something that you have that really fits within what they are trying to do hard. They may give up on something else and buy a unique product that costs them more because it really will help them stay well or healthy or protected or immune. So don't think it's only about trading down, but you need to find legitimate ways to help people stay in your brand. You need to be everywhere they want to be. You know, you know that now. You need to gear up for OmniFast. If you're not engaged in e-commerce, that's a huge issue and a huge gap for you moving forward. If you're investing money as companies, this is where you need to invest your money as much as anything else moving forward. And last but not least, you need to embrace what we call the big business of well, this massive drive to live well today, even before the COVID crisis. We need to help people build their immunity and protection using beauty as a way to just to do that, to feel healthier, to be healthier, to stay healthier and live well. You know, one of the things we know very clearly is that people want to get back to being with their favorite people, eating out in restaurants, going shopping, and beauty. One in five already tell us of the total population, they want to get back into their beauty, grooming, fitness routine, and that goes up 10 points for women. So a third of the population of women are already eager to get back to beauty the way they knew it. But the fact of the matter is, for all of us, it's not going to be the way they or we knew it. And we have to understand that the story of beauty and the way we tell our beauty story will change. The power of beauty to be transformative now, the power of beauty within this new world we live, in which we live, is so strong and fundamental. But we can't think about beauty the way we all think about beauty or have. And that's the opportunity. So there's lots more to come in this rock and rolling ride, right? This is a dynamic and changing situation. And so for the next year, we are going to be madly out there with all this work as we track this road to the next normal, constantly looking at what's changing, how the dynamism evolves in this world. So wish I, what I will wish you now is a, is a smart way to journey to the next normal, to take care of yourselves, to be well, and of course, to be beautiful because we know the transforming power of a great lipstick means you can do anything, anywhere, anytime. Thank you. Wendy, thank you so much. Um, that was really fantastic. So we're just, um, we have a few questions and I'll come back on the screen here to ask them. Um, I wanted to start off with this one and this is something that you touched on toward the end. Um, what if you're a brand, you know, such as a color cosmetics brand, as you mentioned, what if you're a brand that really isn't grounded yet in health and wellness? How do you participate in this in this situation without going, you know, too far in the wrong direction? Yeah, and that's a great question. Thank you, Leslie. You know, I think we have to understand what 
health and wellness really means to consumers and shoppers today. Before COVID, in the middle of COVID and moving out. This isn't just about being having natural ingredients. Health and wellness to people is about that energizing prospect of, if I look great, I will feel healthier. How do you message that in a way that's unique? How do you think about the mental health of being inclusive? So as I just said, the transformative power, my mum always said, the transformative power of a, of a red lipstick, she didn't say that, she just said, if you have your lipstick on straight, you can do anything. And that's, that's a very um, uplifting health and mental health um, kind of image. So how do we tell that story um, to our community, to our followers, to our, the people who are loyal to us? But it's not just in the messaging, it's in the packaging. How do we think about, you know, people are talking about sustainability still in the, in the depths of this crisis, but people are still concerned about the health of the world. Well, they're doing it because they understand this was a very interconnected disease that we had. So how do I think about sustainability and my packaging? How do I think about the way I treat my employees and the people who work with me in the stores? So health and wellness is a very broad platform and don't use, please don't use the excuse, she says like mother waving her finger, don't use the excuse of, oh, that's not the business we're in, so we can't participate. It's a much bigger platform than I think most of us really recognize. Great, thank you. And that actually leads me into the next question. Um, so what are your feelings about the importance of sustainability and free from and natural um, as we come out of this pandemic? Yeah, I think what's interesting here is, you know, there was some, some uh, we've heard it from a number of people saying to us, will that go away? And I would say to you, no, and it won't go away for two reasons. One is that people have already understood this interconnectedness. The fact that I think the number in the, in the presentation, I think I'd remember, um, that 19% of shoppers were already doing more around sustainability. Um, so one in five already doing more, not just the same. Um, very few were doing it less. And the only barrier to clean, free from, sustainable practices is often the cost. And so it's not that the values have gone away, it's that people can't always afford to do it. And we see that in the food business a lot. We have clients in that industry, in the, in the food industry, in the beverage industry. And, and sometimes those products, as in beauty, are premium priced. And one of the great opportunities, but also challenges for us as we move through this is that people will still be very engaged, but they will expect to be able to afford to stay um, focused on taking care of the earth and their communities um, over the long term. So that is a, a, a real uh, opportunity and challenge for many of us in this, in this beauty business. Great, thanks. And we had a couple of questions about DIY. Um, mm -hmm. So do you think the DIY trend in hair and nail will continue even as people you know, start going about their daily lives as, as we did a few months ago? That's a great question. I will tell you, if we go back to 2008, um, I know it seems an eternity ago and it was, uh, people had to cut back and do a lot of things for themselves at home, including not just hair color, uh, but cleaning, cooking, you know, taking care of the kids, not as extreme as now um, where we've got this. So I. I would hazard a guess that many of us who can then afford to will go very go back very quickly to being having a little bit of a being taken care of moment once we can. It's not that we aren't all doing quite a good job. I hope you like my. I have to remember how to colour my hair after about a thousand years, um, but it is an issue um, of both. Can I afford to do it? And if I can, boy, Mum will need a rest. Don't we all raise hands yet again? Mum is all gonna. Mum is gonna need a rest really fast um, once we can get away from being teacher, cook, cleaner, and a business person. Great. And we we had a question. Uh, you just mentioned two thousand and eight, and someone actually had had a question related to that. Um, what prompted looking back at two thousand and eight? What prompted customers to start losing their frugal shopping habits habits that they developed during that time? Was it lifestyle? Was it earnings? You know, can you talk a little bit about about what how 
what you saw then and how might that relate to now? Yeah, you know, it took a long time, I have to tell you. We didn't really see the change um, until we moved through to about 2014, 15. Um, and it was economic. It was really, well, it was two things. It was as the economy improved and people were more reassured of their, their jobs and, and an income or two incomes or sometimes three incomes, they began to sort of put their toes back into the water, so to speak, um, and be less, be not quite as frugal. But I will tell you this, uh, buying behaviors changed and people made choices around things that they had not made before. So we did a study in 2008 uh, called uh, Anarchy because people were angry and they were very frustrated and they were really gonna take control as they are now. Uh, it took until about 2015 where people had a, created a whole new set of values called buy, we call buying happiness. And that was where once they became more financially stable, people then began to think about where they were willing to spend their money and in that instance, it was areas that they could take the stress out of their lives a little bit more, go and get your nails done, your hair done, um, and also overall well-being. And they were willing to spend money on areas like that. So it will be a journey. There is absolutely no doubt, but it's generally driven by sort of the economic factors more than anything else. And now we'll shift a little bit to online shopping. We had a couple of questions about online shopping. The first is, do you think the shift from live to from live shopping to online shopping will be a trend that will continue, you know, past this crisis? How do you mm -hmm. see that in place? Yeah, yeah. Um, I do, but I think there will be a little um, two steps forward, one step back in it. I think two things. One, for many of us, again, because of our incredibly busy lives, online shopping in many categories had become as much just something we could do at 11 o'clock at night when the kids went to bed as anything else. So it became this tremendous efficiency um, and access, not just about price anymore, it was a lot about convenience and saving time, and that will not go away. I think the, the challenge here is that one, many of the companies, particularly beauty companies, in their online offer, often have very sort of transactional offers. So it's all item price, item price, thank you, Amazon. No, not to insult Amazon, but for many of the companies, it's been very much that. And I think in order to both keep people engaged, we need to create a much stronger online experience. And some of the retailers who do this well, we know, the Sephora's of this world and Ulta's of this world do a lot of good work around creating an experience. But the other thing is, I think we all have this push me, pull me, and that is very much, if you think about ordering online now, you know how hard it is to get your groceries if you're ordering online, you know, it's hard to get a slot. Things don't come as quickly as you might expect. Um, sometimes the system's complicated and crashes. All of those kinds of things have happened. So all of this influx to shopping online because I need it to be convenient and now I can't get out of the house, it's not so perfect. So I think there are a lot of things that will create um, a frisian, if you will, between online versus in store. But I think the fundamentals of convenient and easy, and if we can get the experience right, people are, will move towards that. That doesn't mean they won't go to the stores, but the stores will have to be very different. And this movement was already in place before we, we struck, or COVID struck us. Um, so this isn't just a COVID related um, issue at all. Great, thank you. And we we had several questions um, that came. You're looking at this from a fragrance point of view. Um, how to, so? I'll ask the kind of a, a one question that combines them all. How do you see all of this impacting fragrance? Are you seeing some of the same trends um, in 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 retail? And how could fragrance brands start to also participate in this kind of next normal? Yeah, I really do. I think in some ways. Um, again, I think we saw it in, in before we we hit this crisis, but in some ways, fragrance is very well positioned for this. Um, maybe not literally the fragrance that we, you know, put on every day, those of us who do, even when we're working from home. Um, I do, I'm one of those, raising my hand yet again. Um, but this notion of fragrance as, I'm now spending much more time at home, and I will suspect that as we move back and, and society opens up more, 
this working from home will continue to be an important issue um, and remain for many companies, or at least the flexibility. So home as a space will become uh, more and more important, not just that you know sleeping weekends place. And I think that's where fragrance can play a very strong role, whether it's you know home fragrance, whether it's how we use fragrance. Um, and essential oils for our health and wellness. I think there are a lot of factors here, lifestyle factors, shopping life factors, if you will, that actually create a real opportunity for fragrance. Again, like everything in beauty, if we're willing to sort of step back and deconstruct it within this context before we put it all back together. But I do think this is a real opportunity for fragrance through a different lens as we move forward. We had a question um, from a few PR and communications people just looking for, for some advice. Um, do you, how do you think that PR and communications um, professionals should start to pitch their brands from a wellness viewpoint, um, especially if the product is already, already the, a normal ingredient list? If it's already doing something special, how can it now start pitching from this new wellness point of view? You know, I think this, this, and this is sort of the comment I made about cosmetics before, I think that we, all of us in the beauty business have to step back and say, what business are we really in here? And, you know, wellness is about many things, as I said. It's about well-being and feeling good. It's about caring. We, we began to track what we call our caring index about two or three years ago, and it was all grounded in, in um, the way people thought about retailers and did the retailers really care for you, the shopper. But that caring is something that's reflected much more broadly in the way we sell beauty, the way we reflect um, how we think about our companies. One of the things that's become very clear in all of this, and, and we've heard it and we've seen it, we've, we've, um, we've certainly asked people about it, is you know, who cares for me now and why and what does that mean? And of course, you know, you see obviously the frontline workers and you see um, brands that are being much more supportive of their communities and their people and their internal teams. But this notion of how do I present a message um, for current wellness oriented brands or non traditional wellness brands in beauty has many facets to it. And I would suggest in, in any kind of marketing and communication, it's very much about a whole story about all the things the brand or the company does to take care of us and their people and their world. And I think that's a very powerful message um, that we all need to be considering now as we move forward. Thank you. And one last question. We had several questions um, from people who are just really looking toward what's next. And I know nobody has a magic ball, but um, I'll kind of put this into two part question. One, do you think people will go back to in-store shopping? That was, a, I love that question. It was very upfront. And yeah. two, what, what do you think will drive people back and what will it look like? Yeah. Um, yes, I do think people will go back to stores. We are very social beings. Um, I think people will be very cautious about it and I think they'll be very selective about it. Um, and the selectivity, the caution is obvious, you know, will these people be taking care of not just me when I walk in to a physical space, because many of us have still walked into the drugstore, to the supermarket, right, to the PetSmart, to the Home Depot, whatever, we've been there. Um, so will it be safe? And if it's safe, okay, I'm willing to go in if I have a need. But when I am there, what will this story tell me? What will the experience be? Will I still be selling the same old stuff? Or will I have a different kind of experience in these spaces? We are social animals. So that ability to connect to people socially, and retail plays a very big role in that, that ability to connect will be really important again. And in some ways, I think for those of us who have been out shopping um, for our families, we've seen those relationships change with the people who are working in the stores. It's a very emotional thing. Um, so I think, yes, the, the short term is that's the, the immediate answer is that. 
And now I forgot the second part of the question. I knew I would forget, Leslie. What's part two? I think you answered it. It was really looking at, you know, what will it look like when people start to go back and what's going to drive them to go back? Yeah. So the social socialization will be, and I'll give you one example. If we've got a second coming out of coming out of September 11. You know, when people first felt safe, they went back to the malls. Now I'm not suggesting a mall discussion here. We don't have time, but they went back to the malls, not necessarily to shop, but they felt like it was kind of a safe place that they could walk almost like European style, arm in arm, and walk around and just sort of engage externally again. And I think that's what retail is. It is a very powerful engagement between people, not just stuff. And I think that's the message we all have to remember as we rebuild these retail spaces and the role of the people who work for us in those spaces who can engage with us in, in very emotional and different ways beyond just selling stuff. Great, thank you for the look into the future. I know that's a difficult question, but we had so many people who are just really wondering, you know, what's coming. Sure. Um, thank you to everyone who asked questions. They were amazing, um, really appreciate that. And Wendy, thank you to you for this wonderful presentation. Thanks all, be well, be beautiful, wear your lipstick. <laughs> Thanks everybody, have a great afternoon, bye.